Good morning, and welcome to the public worship of God this morning. Whether you are here in the building with us or worshiping from home, we are very happy to have you with us. One important person I need to add to the list of thank yous for today's service is Gray Hunsinger, who is working with Jenna Davis in the, the booth. And let us worship God. in the call to worship. Come to the water, all you who thirst. Come to the water, all you who are weary. Come to the water, all you who long for a justice. For God is here among us washing away the dust and grime of our lives and pouring out the spirit on all who thirst. Let us, the excuses, the excuses we have, we have made, made for not, for not living, living in the reality of the kingdom of God. For our blindness to the needs of others. And our preoccupation with our own agenda. For our failure to pay attention to the still, small voice in our lives. For our surrender to fear and self-protection, Lord, have mercy. For harsh words spoken to our friends. 
and love withheld from our enemies. Lord, have mercy. For seeking success rather than faithfulness. For praying without acting. Lord, have mercy. For our life's choices this week. That have not contributed to greater love and justice in the world. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, you are our strength and our might. You have become our salvation. Listen to what God says. I have taken away the judgments against you. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. With joy, we will draw water from the wells of salvation. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Reconciled with God, let us celebrate this mercy by greeting each other with a sign of Christ's peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Please stand and from your place share signs of the peace of Christ with one another.
scripture reading. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning is taken from the prophet Amos. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither. At the top of Carmel dries up. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice rule down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The New Testament lesson is from John's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow waters of living water. May God bless these readings to our hearing, our understanding, and our faithful response. Amen. Thank you, Ken. When last we spoke, King David had died, and his son Solomon was ruler over his father's legacy, the United Kingdom of Israel. A lavish temple was built during Solomon's reign, and although the wisdom of Solomon is legendary, he spoiled his children rotten, and they became selfish and greedy. His successor to the throne, son Rehoboam, alienated the northern tribes which seceded to form their own nation of Israel, also called Samaria. The southern kingdom of Judah contained Jerusalem and the Temple of Solomon. Years pass, kings and prophets come and go. The biblical writers closely tie the military success and economic prosperity of both nations to the faithfulness of first of their kings and then of the people. If the leaders are obedient to God, their constituents follow their lead, and God blesses Israel or Judah with victory on the battlefield and abundant harvests. If the kings and people chase after idols, or in some other way disobey God's commands, they are defeated by their enemies, suffer from drought, famine, and other consequences of their unfaithfulness. This is how the biblical writers convey the story of God and God's relationship with the people of God. They infuse every thought, action, and circumstance with theological meaning. So the Bible is not an unbiased, objective history. It is a narrative told from a specific point of view through the lens of faith. I think that reading the Bible while understanding its theological intent helps us to uh, um, hear God's words so that we can better apply its teaching to our lives today. Back to the story. Fast forward several generations. Uzziah is king of the southern kingdom of Judah and Jeroboam II has ruled Israel in the north for 40 years of relative peace. 
Israel attains a height of territorial expansion and national prosperity never again reached. This is like the apex of all that. The military security and economic affluence which characterizes its age are taken by many Israelites as signs of God's special favor toward them. Furthermore, they feel they deserve the Lord's goodwill because of their extravagant support of the official shrines. Amos, a sheep breeder and minor prophet, travels north from his home in Judah to deliver a difficult message to his neighbors in Israel. The one that Ken read for us. Amos lets the people of Israel know in no uncircum terms that they as a whole are not on as good a terms with God as they think they are. The prophet turns to poetry and declares, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, where the temple and the only legitimate place of worship is, according to those in Judah. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the tops of Carmel, Carmel withers. Amos's opening couplet set the tone and let his listeners know right away God is not happy. It's like a teenager returning after an evening out and he's just skipping up the stairs and happy to be home and his sister steps out of the shadows and leans in and says, Mom's mad. Amos begins his discourse by telling the people of Israel that God is mad. For two chapters, Amos speaks God's judgments against neighboring nations, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, even Judah, which is Amos's homeland. The remainder of the nine chapter book is dedicated or directed almost exclusively to Israel. What has God so angry that he roars like a lion in retribution and judgment for page after page. Two words, injustice and hypocrisy. In chapter five, starting with verse 11, we read, therefore, because you trample upon the poor and take from him exactions of wheat, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you will not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and who turn aside the needy in the gate. The Lord's condemnation of the way some Israelites treat the poor and downtrodden is repeated many times throughout the book. It is clear that during the 40 years of peace enjoyed during Jeroboam II's reign, some of the Israelites have built great wealth on the backs of the less fortunate. People are exploited and suffer economic deprivation while others become more and more rich, accumulating much more affluence than they could ever need. It is the opposite of God's economy taught in the wilderness when God instructs his people to collect manna every morning, but only enough for the day. If they try to take more than they need for that day, the extra which they have hoarded spoils, and what happens? There are worms in the bread. But the injustice of Israeli society is only half the story. I hate, I despise your feasts and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, says the Lord. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and cereal offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted beasts, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. God is mad. The thing that really enrages God is the hypocrisy of those who are benefiting from the suffering of the poor. They come to the shrines on the Sabbath and put on a grand show of worshiping God, bringing the best animals for sacrifice, 
singing at the top of their lungs, strumming their harps to beat the band. And then, when worship has ended, they turn right around and exploit their fellow citizens for their own gain. Their worship has done nothing to inform the, or affect their behavior, their ethics. And they don't even see the error of their ways. Today it's called prosperity gospel. The idea that God wants me to be rich in every aspect of my life, materially as well as spiritually. And if I am succeeding financially, then I am in good relationship with God because he is blessing me by increasing my bank account. John D. Rockefeller believed in this worldview. He established the Standard Oil Company in 1870 with partner Harry Flagler. As Standard Oil grew, Rockefeller was notorious for acquiring smaller companies, sometimes through ethically questionable means. Rockefeller didn't stop to consider the injustice of what he was doing, believing that as long as he was blessed with profits, God was pleased with his performance. In 1911, the Supreme Court ruled that Standard Oil was an illegal monopoly and broke the corporation into 34 smaller companies. The elite of Israel, too, thought that they were okay with God for two reasons. Their worship practices were stellar. They did everything by the book. They weren't trying to pass off their inferior livestock as sacrifice. They brought the best they had. And in every other way, they were worshiping just as they thought they were supposed to be. And the other reason that they thought that, their, that affirmed for them their right relationship with God was that their coffers continued to increase. Amos came to correct their misunderstanding. God was so disgusted by the way the people treated one another, he could not accept their attempts at worship until justice rolled down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The Reverend Rob McCoy said, Worship should move us to justice, and justice should inform our worship. So, you know, they work hand in hand. In 1972, Hurricane Agnes ravaged the East Coast, causing flooding in several states. The hardest hit was Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, where our family lived from 1988 to 2003. So we missed all the excitement. When we arrived, 16 years had passed since the floodwaters filled the streets, towns, and cities along the Susquehanna River which overflowed its banks. Yet the Agnes flood was never far from the minds of those who survived it. Frank's parishioners shared stories and photo books and told time from June 1974. Everything was before the flood or after the flood. We were told that the manse in which we lived for a few years had a water a foot deep on the second floor. The Gothic-style church building had water lapping at the base of their stained glass windows, and their stained glass windows um, were higher than ours. You know, they were above my head. Much substandard construction was washed away or condemned because of the flood, and 2,000, this is really macabre, 2,000 caskets rose out of the cemetery, which was along the river in 40 Fort, and floated away. Everybody and everything was affected by Agnes, and life in the Wyoming Valley was never the same. It is this image of flood that Amos uses when he describes how God envisions justice, not just a trickle, not a mere stream or brook, not even a waterfall, but a flood. Flood water is powerful, impossible to stop. Floods affect every aspect of the lives of those enduring them. Flooding disrupts and disturbs. It changes the surroundings, sometimes forever. That is what God wants. Justice to look that is what God wants justice to look like for us. Let righteousness flow like rivers. 
Let it pour into your lives. Let justice flood your communities, your churches, your nations. Amos considered his words to be God's words, and Amos was angry. He had a lot in common with Jesus, who was righteously angry in the temple because of the injustice he found there when he overturned the tables of the money changers. Like Amos, Jesus saved his strongest words for the religious hypocrites. We might not act, we might not like the image of an angry, vengeful God, but on the other hand, we may find that we too are angry at the injustices of our world. I hope that this energy produced by our anger will spur us, God's people, into action. Small actions which be begin as a trickle, move into a stream and become a flood of justice and rightness can change the world. As Amos encourages, we can choose to do right and run from evil. When we do this, we find that God is our helper and that generosity begets generosity. When justice prevails, all will benefit. All will thrive. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand and to please say with me our statement of faith that's printed in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. During our um, time of offering, let's think about how we might start the trickle and um, that hopefully becomes a flood of justice and rightness in our community and our world.
are their joys and concerns to bring before the Lord this morning. I'd like to say a big thanks. I've got a whole family row here, and it's a joy having our daughter and grandson and mom and brother and all the, the, the family here today. So it's a joy today. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a joy for all of us to have you here. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for all the relationships which enrich our lives for family and friends and church family. And as the holidays approach, we pray that we might um, be in closer touch with each other and with you. Most especially, we thank you for the relationship that we share with your son, Jesus Christ, and all that that brings into our lives. We pray for our neighbors, Lord, for those who are suffering from injustice, for those who do not have enough, and we pray for our neighbors ha who have much, much, much more than they'll ever need. Help us all to give to one another. Help us to realize that generosity begets generosity and do what we can to bring justice into your world, to make it more prevalent. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who continues to teach his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, living as free men and women, girls and boys, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the community of God the Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Um, we have a number of announcements on the back page of the bulletin. I'm only going to mention a few. Um, one is that Holiday Stroll is back, and we're not doing what we used to do, but we're doing something great. If you would like to make a monetary contribution to help cover the expenses, there's a big, big um, plastic jar in the narthex, and um, we will need, P and there's a sign up sheet on the bulletin board right above the jar for people who like to take a shift and help greet our neighbors. A youth group meets this afternoon at 3 o'clock and a lot of what we're going to be doing is getting ready for holiday stroll and also um, assembling the welcome kits that we collected toiletries from all of you for um, People's Place. So 3 o'clock if you're in junior or middle school or high school at the church. 
There will be a meeting of the congregation next Sunday where we will elect our officers. And also following that will be a fellowship luncheon. So I hope everyone will be able to come. Finally, um, I'd like to invite everyone to write a note of encouragement or a, or a we're thinking of you card for Melanie Groff and we will um, bring them with you to church next Sunday and we will send them all off to her in time for her final exam week. And uh, it's her first semester at UD and I think she'll really appreciate all the encouragement from home. So please remember to do that. Are there any other announcements this morning? Please read the, the rest in your bulletin as you can. <laughs>